All right, it is September 26, 2012. Uh, this is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. Um, and uh, what we're doing is interviewing independent third-party choices, um, options, uh, candidates that are on the ballots. I want more options. I want more choices. If I had to, um, if I was stuck on an abandoned island and I had to vote for a Republican or a Democrat, I guess I would just, um, you, you, you know, probably just die there, I guess, if that was my only two options. And especially, um, you know, they. what really got me going is they voted for the uh, National Defense Authorization Act I, uh, this year. I, I just said that's enough, is enough, to be quite frank. And actually today, um, we're talking to St Stephen Adalgis, and uh, he's running against Trent Franks, um, who voted for that um, as a Republican, and that Gene Scharr is running as a Democrat. Steve, um, Stephen is uh, running for the U.S. House District Number Eight in Arizona, and um, so we'll like to inform the public of where he stands um, and, and what he's running on, what motivates him, a little bit about himself. Um, and uh, so, Stephen, good evening. Thank you for taking the time to do this interview. So um, we have a more um, informed, educated public. Um, and we know more of our options. Um, and if you could tell us a brief summary biography of yourself about your District 8, or I, I should say this year, what would District 8 looks like because they change once in a while. And, and what got you motivated to run, sir, to, uh, to step forward, to be in position in case people have had enough and, and, and they, you know, they, um, they gravitate towards that other option? Sure, thank you very much, Tom, for having me tonight. I really appreciate it as well. Uh, I'm uh, running in District 8 in the state of Arizona, and uh, our, our state did receive one extra representative based on the most recent census that did cause a remapping of the state, and the uh, borderline for the new District 8 mostly contain, contains the northwestern suburbs of the city of Phoenix, Arizona, so it'd be names like Glendale, Surprise, Sun City, things like that. Some of the northern suburbs and some of the western suburbs as well, but the predominant area is the northwestern suburbs of the city of Phoenix. I am running uh, as an American's elect candidate. I'm actually the first candidate for any office at any level uh, with the American's elect party. And um, mission to run, I'm sorry. I just said awesome. Yeah, please continue. Yeah. Sir. This is, uh, oh, no so, problem. Yeah, this is um, kind of like a little bit of breaking news, but go ahead. That's great. That's great. Yeah, a little bit. I guess, I guess I've guess uh, i made some history in some regards here. But uh, um, actually, my motivation for running really ties back to the events surrounding uh, sequestration. And to put it in just simple terms, it's because our nation's broke and we continue to spend money out of control. Um, specifically, I do tend to be more libertarian in views, but I do strongly believe in some pragmatism as well, especially in that if we've committed to purchasing something, whether it was a good or a bad decision, and unfortunately most of the time it's a bad decision, but once we've made that commitment, we need to pay for it rather than continuing to borrow money and really saddling future generations with mountains of debt. Yeah, I mean, saddling future generations isn't um, a good thing. Um, that, that, you know, I mean, it, it it's kind of just kind of flies over, you know, I think most people hear that heads just kind of like, you, you know, you might hear of a disaster halfway across the world. It's, uh, what, what did he just say? Yeah, we're saddling um, the future generations with, um, with debts, uh, you know, which could be considered you, you know, just uh, lot, lots of different things, how you could explain that. And, um, uh, well, and, and what I would say is that, you know, one of the founding principles of our nation was that we were fed up with taxation without representation. And we are doing that to our children and our grandchildren. They are being, they will be taxed without representation because those, those bets will be there for them whenever they, and, and they are not necessarily even yet born. Yeah, that's ver that's very very true. I mean, another thing we don't want to saddle future generations with is, um, you know, a police state, an empire. Um, how about like a democratically elected republic um, that you, you know has a strong constitution, a balance of powers, where people can, uh, you know, 
pursue happiness um, and uh, you, you know you, you know how the story goes um, and um, and that's what happened um, a long time ago not too long ago it wasn't a super long time ago actually this is kind of a new experiment um, some things that have happened recently that relates is in 1992, like your American Select um, Party, Ross Pro kind of started the Reform Party, and, and I would say that was like the first Tea Party, the first Occupy. People were sick of it then, and he almost, you know, won in a three-way race, um, except that he dropped out and came back in. If he didn't do that, I think he might have, you know, gotten a lot bit higher. And then things kind of, you know, people kind of settled in in the 90s, and then 2000 we had, you know, 9/11, and then you know we had Bush. People are so sick of Bush, and and the Republicans, they had a full house and a senate and a president so they were given a chance and then they elected a democrat house and then they elected obama and then the democrats had a full house a full senate and a president and then you, you know two years later you know can't have it anymore so we we went back to a republican um, house not because they liked the republicans or didn't forget you know how bad it was under republicans as the media story goes it's because they don't want any of them to be in there for too long to cause too much damage it's the only way they know how to avoid these people and um and and there's a better way instead of not voting just continue that theme of not voting for a republican or a democrat they really are the problem presenting another one of them will be just adding you, you know they'll be um giving a problem to a problem um and uh, so now here i've heard of american select um and uh that's kind of like it's kind of like reform party-ish um and and it's exciting because we've interviewed libertarians green parties independents um, one or two other third parties but not anyone on the american elect um and so that's that's pretty exciting yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I'll uh, expose my age a little bit here. The very first presidential election that I uh, voted in was the 1992 uh, presidential here, election, and I and I did and I did vote for Ross Perot in that in that uh, race. Uh, yeah, to, to tie in just a little bit more detail on the Americans elect, I mean, they really were uh, just an option to try and consolidate the efforts of the various uh, different independent um, movements that are out there throughout the country to give an opportunity for either an independent or a split ticket or some other type of uh, um, representation for uh, a third choice at the um, presidential level. Now, unfortunately, uh, they weren't able to, to get everything together, but the various state-level parties were, were in place, and I'm you know, a firm believer in that aspect of the Americans' elect. Also, you know, they were uh, trying to... Um, uh, move forward some of the ideas around internet voting, and um, I also was strongly in support of that as well. So with both of those things, uh, consolidating the effort of independently-minded candidates and the uh, internet voting ideas, well, the internet voting, I would be, you, you know, it, it just, uh, like, uh, I think some people are nervous about the electronic voting that's going on. Um, sure. Some of them uh, seem like they're getting, like, almost like no-bid contracts as well, and, and they seem totally unaccountable, and, and, and it seems like elections should be something that's done at the public sector, um, at least that, that has oversight and people that swear to uphold the Constitution and are publicly accountable. I mean, what are your thoughts on, on election reform in general, including that? Well, no, even you make a great point there. It, it does have many people. And electronic voting now, wasn't over the Internet, by the way, also. I mean, not to say... Yeah, that, those were just machines. Yeah. yeah. But, but people with yeah, and, 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 and there, from Radio Shack could hack it, you know. Yeah. Right. It, 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 there, there are definitely some potential problems uh, through that. Now, I, I would argue that at the party level, that is um, really more of a concern of that group coming together on their own. So if they feel, any, any party feels that they you know, can organize around that in an independent manner, that's up for them and their freedom of, of association to, to make their uh, decisions in that manner. Now, at the general election time frame, definitely we would need to make sure that the safeguards um, for fraudulent activity, hacking, so forth, are in place. And I would totally agree with you in that regard. Yeah, I mean, have it so open where that um, if there's any uh, risks, they're going to be... Um 
they're going to be fully seen uh, right away. And um, so it's going to have to be strong enough where it can be completely open, yet prevents that kind of fraud. Um, and uh, it, it's, that's why, it, plus, I mean, it could, but the spirit of it, the reason why they would want that is because they want more people voting. And so, like, exactly. I, I mean, we could make, you know, the first Tuesday of November a national holiday. We could, um, you know, make it 20, uh, the polls open 24 hours. We could have, you know, uh, the better media um, distribution um, or maybe just have a public election channel or something and um, maybe have uh, third parties, you know, in, because in some districts they actually require more signatures than Republicans and Democrats and, um, and, and things like that also could play a big role. In leveling yeah, a level, a level playing field, I think, is really important there. And, and um, you know, any sort of new ideas to encourage greater participation, I think, are definitely ideas that should be looked at, for That's sure. I, mean, I, I'll give you an example. Um, within my district, for the primary, we had about 21% turnout of eligible voters. So that's, you know, obviously quite a few of the... Uh, people in the population decide not even to register, and then amongst registered voters, to have one out of five actually participate in the primary, that's, that's atrocious to me. So anything I think that would encourage greater participation, all of the things you said are really good ideas, and I think the Internet voting and other Well, other, here's other another methods. thing that would encourage it. Like, Congress has a 10% approval rating. I mean, just action after action that they've done, um, they've created a big security complex that's bigger than the military industrial complex. There's a lot of like revolving doors and FDA. There's on um, the bailouts, which the Occupy Wall Street people and the Tea Party both opposed. Everyone was against the bailouts except for the people who voted for Congress. I mean, McCain and Obama, I remember after the 2008 debates, they rushed back to Washington and, and, and pushed off the debate so they could both vote for those bailouts. Um, like a bunch of lap dogs running to their masters and, um, and, and against the will of the American people. Um, the people didn't want to bail out all those companies and reward them and, and give nothing to themselves and just be a drain on the economy. Of course, that's not in their best interest yet. They get away with it. Um, I mean, uh, I, I mean, some people I think think if you don't vote, that's going to send a message. It, it might, it might send a message if absolutely no one voted, and then if you you would also have to not participate in paying taxes and stuff because remember the candidate can vote for themselves as well, and even if they won by one vote, I don't think they would have any shame not to use the power that you know they would give themselves with that one vote, you know, and. Um, it, Absolutely. And, and uh, lack of participation, I don't think, is the answer. Obviously, the, the system, quote-unquote, needs reform, but we need to work within the system that we have to try and make that reform. I mean, this is a life-and-death situation. I'm doing this. I'm, you know, we just started libertarianprogressive.com. It's kind of a pun on the names, but also um, we see a um, United We Stand type of um, coalition on, on a lot of big issues from transparency, accountability, um, our, you know, our actions um, mirror a empire instead of a republic, um, civil liberties, and, and just, um, you, you know, figuring out um, after going in lots of vicious cycles that the solutions are going to be um, I, I, I see the path of least resistance to a brighter future as getting a new House of Representatives. That seems like the easiest tool that we have available to us. Um, and, uh, and that's why we're interviewing 50 plus people representing 50 people from each state. Steve kind of asked me earlier, like, you, you know, about libertarian progressives. So that's why I just want to spend a second to expand on that because um, that, that's really it. We're not asking for your money. We're asking you to donate to Steve and people like him. And we don't need to be like a, a big organization. You don't have to sign up or log into our website or nothing. These, it's just sharing an idea that what if 50 people um, this year were elected to the Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senate that were not um, Republicans or Democrats and, and that would uphold their oath and, and agree on some fundamental big trillion dollar issues. Forget about the million dollar stuff. Yeah, we're talking about trillions of dollars here. And um, and uh, so what about foreign policy and, 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 and the budgets? Um, I, I mean, there's already lots of sites where people can meet up, like meetup.com. Use sites like that, but spread this idea and, um, and, and be more informed. And so, Stephen, what about the foreign policy, um, our, our foreign policy, which actually is about, if you can count the military, uh, you, you know, a big chunk of our budget, probably about 30% of our budgets? Absolutely. 
Um, as far as foreign policy goes, and, and then uh, specifically in regards to defense, um, I didn't go uh, too much into my background at the very beginning, but uh, in terms of uh, me, I've never run for a political office, but I have served the nation and I have served it proudly. I'm a 1996 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, and I was a naval officer, a surface warfare officer for five years after graduating from, from the Naval Academy. So I have served the nation, and I have seen defense policy firsthand, having been a part of it. Um, and we'll probably touch on this a little bit if, we, if we're if we able to talk about some of the uh, personal freedom issues as well. But in regards to defense, I am very much a strong proponent of a strong defense, but not for any sort of an intervention of foreign policy. That's really important to me that, that we keep ourselves secure from outside attacks, but not that we're... Um, projecting our power towards others in, in an interventionist way. We, we shouldn't really be any sort of the police of the world type of a thing. Yeah, um, like Martin Luther King Jr. said, we're, are we the policemen of the world? And, and, and like, um, you know, kind of Eisenhower said, I, I think um, uh, it, it's amazing, but I, I mean, I, I would almost feel bad like if any of the founding fathers could find a time machine and, and come back, or, 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 or even people like Dwight Eisenhower from not too long ago, I mean, they would probably be treated nicely by the politicians, but, um, but uh, you know, they, they would, if they said the same things they said then, they would be booed off the stage. Um, and uh, if, 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 if they had to wear, like, a mask or so on and no one knew who they were, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> um, and, and you know, D Dwight Eisenhower is a great example because the warning that he gave us around the military-industrial complex is, to this day, you know, coming back to roost that, you know, he was, uh, had very good foresight with that comment uh, in his um, his farewell address farewell as speech. president. Yeah. yeah as two-term Republican president who was like, you know, supreme commander of the Allied forces. And yeah, I think he, you know, he's not like a chicken hawk or anything like that, I would say. No, by no means. And, and but for sure, we need to maintain a technological superiority and oh, yeah. you know, ensure that we're that we are, you know, keeping our weapon systems current and and uh, and effective for a defensive posture. Oh yeah, we and should that, be that, able that's to absolutely be important. Generations ahead, I I would I think you know a lot. Everyone would agree with that. I mean, um, you know, if anyone messed with us, they would be you, you, you know history and. Um, so that's that's for certain but i mean it just looks like you know just around the world we look like we're we might not be totally acting like an empire yet but we look like an empire and i know we were warned against that and uh, it's a republic for which we pledge our allegiance to you know and for which it stands and uh, not an empire and um and uh, that's a serious issue, and, and it's a big part of the budget. And if we can't defend ourselves in the halls of Congress against lobbyists who want, you know, special contracts and things like that and, and don't want any accountability or auditing, then, you know, how can we defend ourselves against, you know, threats out there? Absolutely. Yeah. And as far as, uh, you know, that, that part of things goes, I mean, my initial comment around sequestration. At the time, neither side was willing to give an inch to come together on realistic budgetary reform, both on the spending and on the revenue side of things. Now, with the sequestrations inside uh, going into effect, you know, then, the, then the comment comes, well, we can't do anything in terms of hurting our defense budget. Well, absolutely we can if we go through it line by line and make sure that we're doing it in the most effective manner, that we're ending, you know, the war in Afghanistan and all the drain that that causes for us. Well, that's in the Constitution. Uh, <laughs> Every penny spent should be accountable for, I believe. Absolutely. And the Pentagon, although, you know, to a degree responsible, they're only working within what they are given by Congress. So Congress needs to be able to say no. No is okay sometimes. Yeah, and oh, then, yeah. You know, depending, sometimes they're given depending more, on sometimes what they have. They might have some black budgets, too, that we might not know about or, you know, set up corporations so they can, you know, have money funneled through there, and the Federal Reserve can, um, you know, finance them as well. Actually, 
under the audit um, recently um, that was, you know, um, done, uh, reported by Bloomberg, and it was the audit that they passed a couple years ago. Um, Barney Frank, um, Ron Paul, um, they did get a partial audit and found out the Fed, you know, lent $15 trillion across the world and, and the U.S., and uh, that's, you know, about a five times or something bigger budget than, you know, our Congress gets to play with each year. It's amazing sometimes. It's a huge budget, and, um, and 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 so yeah, they don't really even have the power of the purse. I mean, so what about um, you know Social Security, Medicare? Um, you know, do you think? You know, I, I think it, it, those are those are programs that eventually I think would need to go away. Um, I, I, as I had earlier mentioned, I'm also a pragmatist, so it would have to be an easing out from them. I believe in order to prevent chaos. But as, as an end state, I do believe that those types of programs would eventually need to go away. On my website, I you know laid out some ideas around Social Security to try and ease it back, kind of pushing out the years even further than they have been already. Yeah, well, um, I heard it can well be the, fixed pretty well, I mean, if we don't raid the trust fund and if we, um, uh, you know, do some, you know, gradual age raise plus combined with means testing, that can make it uh, pretty solvent for a while, at least better than the situation we're in now. Yeah, I would like for every American to be able to handle their own retirement directly. I think as an end state, that is important. Well, I mean, could it be voluntary? I mean, what about, like, if you want to do that, you're certainly welcome to. And then if you want to, you know, if you feel more comfortable doing it through the government, um, then, uh, uh, you, you know, you, so it's an option, but it's voluntary. As long as we uh, maintain the personal responsibility aspect of those that choose to go the voluntary route of not participating, that they would have to have some sort of buy buyback in or not even be allowed to re-participate at the later date. I, I would be okay with voluntary participation, voluntary non-participation. Yeah. I, I think that would be okay. But, you know, it, there need, need to be safeguards in place uh, sure. if someone doesn't make bad decisions and then later down the road want the government to bail them out at a personal level. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, that's one thing I think where left and right can agree on. I mean, as long as it's voluntary and it pays for itself and there's lots of safeguards, I mean, that's the that's the strength of our government, that there is so much balance of power between the Senate, judiciary, executive, media, um, people with their Bill of Rights and uh, all the constitutional civil liberties. I, I mean, it evens out the playing field, and, and perhaps, I mean, that's one thing, uh, that you, you know that we could improve upon is even increase more balances of power and oversights. I mean that might be something you, you know that could use some reform. Um, I'd, I'd, so um, what about um, health and you know um, the Obamacare, um, you, you know health insurance. Um, you know we do spend about 20 percent of our GDP on health care and uh, do you see um, s some solutions that you've been thinking about I know it's a big topic and and, and there might be yeah. other solutions in the future even that are unknown yet but you know what say you absolutely on that? And, and that and that's one of those things where you know it, um, it, it, it is a uh, ongoing discussion um, in, in progress but I think uh, some of the main things that I look at there are uh, decoupling um, your health care from employment. I mean, basically, for the majority of Americans, they are lockstep. Your, your employer provides your health care. And there's various aspects of the tax code that make that a reality. That's, that's a uh, um, holdover from some of the wage controls that have been put in place, a bad decision by the federal government previously that, you know, the, the way that the uh, employers were able to work around that was, well, now we'll just provide better fringe benefits to make up for the fact. It makes people more dependent rates. on corporations, too. Um, and, uh, Absolutely. It, it, it's, it, it, it kind of loses a whole individual responsibility aspect of it and um and, and it, so it encourages um, people to be, you know, I mean, we shouldn't get our insurance from our employers. I mean, what are they going to tell us to do next? Brush our teeth and stuff. And um, it's uh, it's well, they probably could, but I I mean, you know, they don't want someone with a stinky breath around the office. But 
but seriously, <laughs> I, I mean, that's, I mean, we, we, we don't want to be nannied by corporations, and I'm sure they'd rather not do that for us, you know? I mean, that's, it's, 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 we're, we're, it's our job. We're not married to it, and we shouldn't get our health insurance from, you know, our job. Exactly, and, and if there weren't those sort of subsidies that occur as a result, that would allow for some increased competition that I think both would drive down price as well as expand the availability. Um, and that's, that is one of the things that Obamacare tried to address was availability. I'm, I'm against that because it had no sort of um, issues around the controlling of cost. How about trading between and state lines? Um, you know, which is I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of that idea. I think that um, you know, the ability to buy insurance across state lines is, again, that increases the uh, competition within the insurance carriers and eventually would allow for prices to, to go down, I believe. I mean, and, and what about, you know, a free market of, like, being able, I, I mean, I think it's still illegal to buy, you know, prescription drugs from Canada, right? Um, should we be able to do that? The reimportation, you know, as far as the exact uh, legal aspects of that, I'm not 100% sure. I guess I should be as a candidate for Congress. And I don't know the answer to that. I don't see a problem with it personally. I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, if a person can, and again, it's a, it's a competition issue. And competition is always a good thing. Now, there there if, is never, never a time when it is not. Yeah, no, absolutely, and and it seems like, and we keep bailing out, like we bailed out AIG, which is a big insurance company. I'm not sure if they're in the healthcare business, but um, yeah, we're not letting competition work at all because competition means that there are going to be some failures, and, and and we're not letting anyone fail, and at at their competitors' expense too, because I mean AIG's competitors paid indirectly their inflation and taxes for AIG to get bailed out. That's like McDonald's paying for Burger King or something like that. And Obamacare did exempt a lot of these corporations. I mean, the individual mandate, if you're making like between thirty to fifty thousand dollars, you might be really messed up in this whole thing because you know you're not allowed to keep catastrophic insurance. I I think that's what it says. You have to get like a full coverage um and uh, so, um, you know, so why even, hey. you, you, you know, get a health savings account or something like that if, if you just have to get full health coverage, you know? Yeah. And if Obamacare does stay in place, that the HSAs and the MSAs will probably eventually disappear. Um, there, there, there would be little need for them, I think, as far as my understanding of Obamacare does go. And, and again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm against it overall and would, would definitely vote for repeal. There are portions of it that make good sense. Do you think sure. like we should have um, a public option? Again, one that's voluntary, um, so you don't have to participate in it. It's basically a public option, maybe a catastrophic, whatever they can pay for, depending on who wants to participate. If they do participate, it would be something that would have oversight of elected officials. Um, and they would be able to save costs for advertising, executive salaries, and um, and buying in bulk. And uh, and you know it might work out. There could be millions of people who might actually want it. Um, but but the thing is, it's completely voluntary. Um, we, would that be something you would consider? My concern there would be on how would it be paid for other than through taxation. Well, no, uh, it and, would just and that be, would be a major drawback. It would be you would pay for it like like um, like if you want insurance, it would just be it would cost based on however much it costs. That's all. Um, I, you know, I would say that a public option um, as a as a um, I'm sorry as a um, last step backstop of some sort. I, I could be okay with that, but I I think that the main issue that we would run into is that I think competition. In the, in the free market would make it unnecessary if it were a truly competitive market where there weren't ta tax subsidies, where there was the allowance for people to uh, purchase across state lines or, or buy their own private policies and not have to worry about uh, getting it through uh, employment. I think it would make it a non-issue. Well, that, that, that could, um, that really could be the to. case. I mean, if we really, yeah. truly had freedom um, all across the board. But the thing is, I think... Um, 
do, don't, do we need to do things in the right order? It's just kind of like the Glass-Steagall thing. I mean, if we absolutely had a gold standard and, and weren't the lender of last resort, then we wouldn't need Glass-Steagall. But the fact is we do have, like, a lender of last resort and all this stuff. So in the meantime, you know, it probably, like, even Ron Paul voted to keep Glass-Steagall because, um, you know, he was a little bit practical. But even though he would like to have, oh, sure. the big picture, gotten rid of it. I, of I think that the, the, that the repeal of Glass-Steagall was, was very much a contributor to the uh, financial collapse, uh, both directly and indirectly. So that there are, there are definitely, in, in all of legislation, there are good laws. There are also bad laws. And I would consider that glass steagall for the most part, was a good lot to keep things separated and, and help, you know, um, protect people. Exactly what you just said is with uh, um, Federal Reserve being a lender of last resort and, and uh, FDIC insurance covering deposits, you know, keeping uh, people's private deposits out of um, the market that the, um, you know. It's kind of like saying, like, if you want to participate in the FDIC program as a bank, um, you can't, you, 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 you know, uh, mix, like, you, you know, commercial um, uh, investments with personal investments. I mean. Yeah, and, and under the last thing, all that would have been correct. And maybe this However, is, that's another option that, that could be a public option. Then, you know, ba if banks wanted to not be backed by the FDIC and, and have certain regulations, maybe we should allow them to do that. And, um, and, and, but you know, they would strive or, um, or, or dive uh, based on the free market, so they would have to have other well, ways to... Well, in some regards, we already have that. In some regards, we already have that. And, and, um, as far as my, my current profession, profession, I told you that I had formerly been a naval officer, but as far as my current profession, I've been a uh, financial advisor for the past 10 years. And I've helped countless people, you know, uh, make a budget and stick to a budget. And, you know, simply put, and it may sound a little naive even, the federal government is no different. Just add a bunch of zeros to the end of it, it's absolutely no different. So what you just said is, is actually in some regards already in place. Because if you look at savings accounts, which are participating in FDIC, as compared to a money market mutual fund, which really is basically the same thing, however, it's not participating in FDIC. Now, that's a competitive market in some regards and allows for the FDIC. It is a little bit riskier, but it usually has a better rate of return for the, for the investor. So if they're willing to take on that kind of risk on their own and volunteer, voluntarily not participate in FDIC, they have a commensurate better return for themselves. Now, that brings us, though, to the problem that we have bailouts in protecting the FDIC, or the, I'm sorry, the non-FDIC insured deposits that were in those money market funds. If you remember back to uh, September of 2008, there was a moratorium place there where FDIC and Kirkdale coverages were more or less extended to the money market accounts for a period of time. Yeah. So that, that was, you know, just one piece of, of the many different bailouts that were inappropriate because the person was taking on risk with their money market deposits. And, you know, it, it resulted in a better rate of return for them, but it did have more risk. Yeah, just, I mean, that's a good thing to be able to, to, to catch and see. And, uh, I mean, so um, what, what about just, are, do you know about the, National Defense Authorization Act that passed on New Year's Eve uh, last year um, is that something that um, you could you know that troubled you and um, you know about about the the two provisions that were in there I mean there's always an NDAA but this year they added two <laughs> things to it that had provisions um, that's going through the court systems now um, you, you know we have to hope and pray that those two provisions get ruled down they, they have but then they were appealed and and then so um, I, I mean, is that something you would vote against, or? Uh, I, I, in its current form, with especially with the portions uh, regarding the um, um, detention of uh, U.S. citizens without without trial and uh, without uh, charge, I, I think that in and of itself makes the entire law um, inappropriate. Yeah, without and anything. I, I mean, great. And uh, what about the? Um, I'm a big fan of. Uh, I mean, obviously, this would require. A um, both an amendment to the Constitution as well as 
a uh, willing willing executive to participate in it. But I am a fan of the potential for a line item veto at the presidential um, or for, for the president to utilize. I think that as far as um, you know, balance of powers. Um, I think that, yeah, there has to be some safeguards in that. Um, I mean, because it, it could be useful, like under certain conditions, at the same time that the president could really bribe Congress people if he had the line item or she had the line item veto as well. It's a good point. Yeah, but but there, if they could find some ways to prevent that bribing and, and make it, you know, some stipulations about it, then, you know, possibly, you know, or have tried... As with long as we can maintain separation of powers, I think right. that it, it can be a useful item because, I mean, again, we've gotten past it a little bit because it's out of uh, favor, but pork barrel spending will come back if nothing changes. Well, what about I, sunsetting a law like that? Like, try it for 10 years, put it on a sunset provision, and it'll expire unless if, like, you know, three-fourths of Congress decides to re-vote for it or something like that. So, you know, two years I, I think only in that it, it, it's already been struck down by the Supreme Court, or at least oh. the, the, the uh, wording of the Constitution would prohibit it. So, um, you know, I, again... I, I I don't think there's a mechanism to allow for sunset on a constitutional amendment. Uh, no, not <laughs> but, on an but amendment. Maybe it is. Yeah. yeah, I know. So that, that, that's what I'm saying. I I I think that you know in in the um, in the late '90s they went down that road, and, and unfortunately it didn't work out because of a lack of uh, of a constitutional provision that would allow. For well, it. there's two ways to hold people accountable. I mean, it's a mixture of both. It's through process, making the processes have such a balance of power like we have that. Um, that it kind of naturally works out even with greedy people, but then there also is another way to hold people accountable, and that's through elections. And um, so if, if, if the process isn't completely foolproof now, which obviously it's not, it, there, there's another way of actually just, you know, at the just getting good people in there and, 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 and who are going to do good. I know that's not a, a, a long-term thing because eventually people will get corrupted or other generations will so that's why you do also have to have the process but I mean we, we can start with getting some good people there that might encourage you, you, you know a more fair process and um, and so uh, so we did cover you know overseas um, a little bit of civil liberties um, the process the uh, you, you, you know just um, the, the Republicans and the Democrats what about two other issues that I think are important to a lot of people um, uh, abortion and uh, our current war on drugs that has been going on since the Nixon administration. And by the way, we do have the highest incarceration rates in the entire world. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, that really is a shame. I'll address the second question first. Uh, as far as the war on drugs, I would definitely move to end it. I, again, touching on that particular issue, um, during my time in the Navy, the, one of the ships that I was uh, uh, part of, um, our our job was a, as a counter narcotics uh, uh, operation, and seeing firsthand the amount of money that went in to such a minimal result, and really, and we could simply flip it on its head around um, anything of the drug the drug war, the amount of money that's being spent on enforcement on incarceration, the, the lives that are ruined by making something that otherwise a law-abiding citizen becomes a criminal just by uh, using a uh, particular product that's widely used. And I'll be absolutely honest with you, I have never once ever touched the stuff myself, but I feel that the freedom for people to be able to utilize um, substances that are currently considered illegal should be completely up to them as a part of a personal responsibility um, of their own, um, you know, desires. And I, I think that, you know, potential revenue through an excise tax and the money that would be saved, both in, in terms of incarceration, redeploying law enforcement in terms of, uh, you know, ter more serious crimes, violent offenses and thefts and so forth, it would really be a win-win from every angle. And um, so as far as that goes, I think that we immediately need to move towards ending the war on drugs. 
Yeah, it, it, it seems common sense, um, and, and that's what this country was, um, y y you know, built on, um, especially that, that book by Thomas Paine. And, um, and it's, it's just, you know, it's a cost sense, uh, uh, cost um, spending value, I mean, ratio, and, and, and um, uh, it's also hurting a lot of lives. Um, I mean, we really, oh, absolutely. we could have a... Uh, a, a, a drug war memorial um, in Washington, D.C. We could have uh, an emancipation proclamation that will free more people nowadays for victimless crimes than there would have been f for slavery um, uh, in, after the Civil War. We're about the same amount of people, about 200,000 it, it was. And, um, and, and, and just about people um, being strong enough, having the spine to, uh, uh, to call out, the, you know, be a defender for truth. And, and just, I mean, to me that... Um, it's not really that issue in itself. It's just uh, someone who's not afraid of the truth. And uh, so um, it, it just uh, it, we're kind of wrapping up here, but but just about like abortion. And then I'll ask you if there's anything else that we forgot that you'd like to mention here. Sure. And in, in, in that regard, um, that one is, uh, to me, I, I would consider myself to be uh, anti-abortion. I don't consider myself to be pro-life. And um, I'm, I'm probably not in line with a large amount of the populace on this, but I think that logically it makes sense if you really give a thought. But to me, uh, life does not begin at conception. It begins at successful implementation uh, into the womb. Meaning that, you know, I'm okay with embryonic stem cell research. I'm okay with a morning after pill. But as far as... The morning the after pill isn't an abortion, um, by the way. It's a, Ron Paul, a doctor who is pro life said that all it does is prevent the inception from even happening. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it depends on, on how far along we are, but, but definitely, as far as that goes, I, I do not look at that as an abortion. Um, I, I do go back, though, and, uh, you know, I'm not, not typically uh, in line with uh, Rick Santorum in, in many areas, but one of the things that he said in his presidential campaign was that uh, the Constitution is the how of government, but the Declaration of Independence is the why of government. And I look at that as the driver of my thought there, and that the main line that we all remember is that we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, and among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So as long as a law does not, or as long as an action, I apologize, uh, does not impact pursuit of happiness, unless it, of course, impacts liberty or life. As long as, a, uh, as an action doesn't impact liberty, as long as it also doesn't impact life, and as long as a law or as an action would impact life, any one of those things should not be allowable. And to me, obviously, you know, the fetus is a life and it would be murder, so I would be against abortion, but I wouldn't consider myself to be pro-life. Okay, and um, like now, do you think there's any exceptions, life of the mother, rape, um, or, you know? Um, the, health, the health of the mother, for sure. Uh, if, if, if there's any uh, potential for her death or for um, the significant um, medical harm to her, for sure. That would absolutely be up to the, to the mother and her family and her doctor to make the decision. Rape and incest, I know that those are ones that uh, ethically... Um, it, it, that one's a sticky point for me. To me, I believe that we can't punish a child for the actions of their parent. And um, you did mention that I could address other, a few other items. So I would say, you know, that kind of ties into some of the immigration issues that we that we run into, Dream Act provisions, things like that, where you know minors that have that didn't do the wrong thing themselves are being punished by the actions of their parent. And Rape and incest, you know, it is a situation where a crime was committed, but the child's potentially being punished. Now, the sticky point, and, and this is where, I, honestly, I, I'll be 100% clear that I, I, I'm on the fence on it, because I feel like, you know, with the rape and the incest, you could view it where the mother's still being punished if they're forced to carry the term. So that one is a tough one for me, and honestly, I, I don't have an answer. Well, there's no problem with, I mean, being honest, saying you don't have a 100% answer. I don't have a 100% answer, actually, um, because I think the real debate is when life begins. And, um, and 
I, 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 and I think there's, you know, unknowns in this universe that we don't know everything, and we have to admit that. And, and um, so, so if you don't know, then you could say, okay, well, then you should caution on the side of of uh, safety there but um i mean definitely rape incest I, I i i don't know how you know we would enforce it um and um so uh, i think it's a horrible situation all around of course and i think someone who does that you know should get the death penalty but um if, you know if they're convicted with a fair trial or you know beyond a reasonable doubt etc um but that's just me i mean there's a lot of people that have lots of different opinions on it i kind of think you know pretty much the status quo no federal funding of it um uh, and, and and states can adjust some things here and there but but it, it really is a, a, a you know um a debate um and um i i, I don't think um you, you know it you know women should necessarily go to prison for it or anything like that or be punished oh, by no means. But, um but yeah so we'll move on from that i mean it's still like you, you know it, it, i can hear arguments from both sides and be sensitive to them and uh I'm open to them, but um, so I, I, you did mention something about the Second Amendment on your um, website, and, and was there anything else that uh, we haven't, uh, you know, kind of gone over here, sir? Uh, no, I mean, I think that, that pretty well covers it, and again, uh, the um, fairly hot-button issue in my state is, is uh, immigration policy, and I think that just to, to finish out on that one particular issue, I, I think the main thing that we need to view is that Border security and immigration policy, although interconnected, are absolutely two separate things. So, yeah, there's we lots can of have things like the economy and, 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 and things like that as well. And, you, you know, the drug war probably has a big thing to do yeah, now. Yeah, it, it, it does. The drug yeah, war does. And then I, I showed myself. died in Mexico the last year uh, on the, near the border. I mean, that's huge. As, as a you know, directly as a result of that type of uh, uh, drug policy, and and that is true. I mean, obviously, we're the ones consuming it, and yet they're the ones suffering because of that, because of our you know uh, pro prohibition type policies. Yeah, we've already tried prohibition, really should, and, and the same thing happened during work. that prohibition. There was a lot of violence exactly. at the Mexican border then as well. Um, it's it's a repeat, and at least they. You know, amended the Constitution to, to do that. Um, it, it seems like they're doing this without even amending the Constitution. And um, uh, well, who's uh, one? Unfortunately, last, that's become a bit of a habit for us, and it, that would be one of the things yeah, I so would like strongly to. They, they're they they're anarchists actually they're uh, you know um, above the law they, they 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 don't want the rule of law I mean it's really the people that are participating in this are really they're anarchists they're might makes right they're stealing money and, and not apologizing for it and so hey, if they're not apologizing and willing to change we need to make a change and uh, one last question we usually ask everyone is who's someone that's been on your mind recently and, um, and that you, you know you would like to share with us and and, and why is that, sir? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the very first part of the question. Yeah, just somebody um, that that that's on your mind uh, lately, like someone that um, you know that's been on your thoughts during this campaign season that maybe you've read up on, or someone that's uh, close okay. to you or historical. Well, you know, actually, uh, earlier today, uh, whenever we were trying to coordinate things on the uh, on the um, interview. I was actually driving back from a, a rally at the university, uh, I'm sorry, at Arizona State University uh, for Gary Johnson. Uh, and he's uh, obviously, as I'm sure you're aware, as most of your listeners are as well, libertarian president, uh, presidential candidate. And um, I think one of the things that we need at all levels of government is just more choice of potential um, people that line up with the true thoughts of the American public. And, you know... Um, I, I think that if we can get him a, out there a little better and maybe participate in the debates, he's on 47 out of the 50 state uh, uh, ballots and uh, still working hard to get those last three under his belt. So uh, been keeping him uh, at the forefront of my mind. Now he's, As he's I mentioned before, an incredible uh, candidate, one of the most credible. Absolutely, we've absolutely, had. two-term yeah. governor. I mean, he's already been an executive executive. Um, at a govern, uh, you know, high-level government. I mean, sure, Mexico is a, one of our smaller states as far as population goes, but, you know, the, the responsibilities that go with any governorship, regardless if we're talking from 
like Wyoming Arkansas, all the way to California. Yeah, like I mean, Arkansas. It's the same thing. Yeah, Arkansas, Georgia, uh, Texas. I mean, we've had mo- most of our recent uh, presidents have been governors. Great. If, if he even gets 5% of the votes, that means $90 million will go to the Libertarian Party, which would be a great thing. And, and, and so they'll be able to campaign even harder. I, I mean, so hopefully he wins, but I'm just saying, if he even gets 5%, um, you know, the Libertarian Party, um, a third party will get $90 million. It's, you know, a, it's a work in progress for every one of us that are believers in competition and liberty and want third options. We, yeah, all, I mean, we I, all have to go into it knowing that we may not be successful. We have to work our butts off to, to you know, give ourselves a fighting chance. But it's, it's something that is bigger than you or me and that eventually we'll get there. Yeah. And, I, and I just think that we all just need to work hard and, and keep fighting. Eventually it'll come. Through. Well, where's it, are you going to be in any debate soon? Any events coming up, uh, Steve? Uh, we had uh, some uh, uh, local media appearances coming up soon, um, but uh, no specific debates, unfortunately, at the moment. Uh, obviously, you need to, you need uh, two to tango, so uh, our incumbent, I don't think, uh, feels the need to participate in the debate. I'm definitely willing. Uh, if we can make it happen. I would so make that I'll public. Keep you up and, to date for sure. Yeah, I'd make that uh, public and put that out there. Call them out. So, I mean, you know, I would. Uh, d- d- you don't have to personally, but I would say they're chicken if they don't want to debate um, for an elected office, such as the House of Representatives, especially. And um, and, and what are they afraid of? Um, and uh, so, um, you know, that's not really treating their district with respect um, so they can, uh, you know, hear the issues. If they don't want to do that, they should just retire, go home, get a real job. And um, that's what we should tell this whole Congress is to get a real job. And um, and, and for once, um, you, you know, um, and uh, w- well, um, Steve, it's been a, a pleasure. Please visit Dalgos. D O L G O S four F O R Congress C O N R or I'm sorry, just Congress. Um dog is for Congress dot com. C O N G R E S S dot com. And um I'll say goodbye to you real quick, uh Steve, but it's been a pleasure and thank you for um informing us about um where you stand on the issues. Thank you very much, Tom. I really appreciate having the opportunity to talk to you today. Have a great day. Yeah, if people want to know more then just visit your website and uh thanks sir.